Good morning, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here to Molio and uh, to all of the other presenters. I've found this a fascinating experience. Um, I wish you hadn't just said that I had worked in Zurich and Paris since I, I was carefully covering up any foreign experience to shamefully say I can't speak French. But, uh, <laughs> So, anyway, I'm the director of Sedition. Um, the job of explaining what Sedition is has largely been done for me, and thank you very much, uh, Pal, for that. And if you want a job at Sedition any time, then we should talk. <laughs> um, when we first set up Sedition, ultimately, uh, the, the motives behind doing this were various. One part was that uh, we were very aware that through the actions of, uh, of Amazon and Kindle and iTunes and music, people were becoming very used to accessing those art forms in digital media. Um, but we felt that the visual arts had lagged some way behind, and we wanted to address that. Um, another major part of the motivation uh, was, and I hate the word democratize, but the press picked up on that, and it's become part of the story, it was to, to some extent, democratize it. We wanted to make sure that the work of the most renowned and most celebrated artists of our generation were accessible to people who perhaps traditionally are priced out of that market and only able to access or experience those works in the context of the white cube or a museum. Um, the artists we work with, uh, these are some of the figures. Um, as, as Paul mentioned, we basically launched with uh, very recognizable names. There was one other thing we did, which was a slight fudge when we first set this up. Um, Bill Viola, Matt Collishaw, Isaac Julian, Damien Hurst, uh, Jenny Holzer. These figures on here are very recognizable artists. They're not all purely digital artists, although all have some involvement in that field. Uh, but one of the things that we did on the first launch of Sedition <coughs> excuse me, was to make sure that the artworks that we launched were in some way anchored or tied to physical artworks that people would recognize and understand. Um, the reason for that was because this was entirely new. Uh, starting up with Sedition, we were uh, investing significant sums in search engine optimization for the first year uh, until we figured out that we were throwing that money away because nobody knew what a digital edition was, so no one was searching for it. Uh, this was always a learning curve, but obviously this became very much part of it. So that, uh, that in to use very recognizable artists and very recognizable works as the first kind of step was in some ways a, a stepping stone into the, the fuller experience of what Sedition was always intended to be. Uh, this is a little promotional video that we use uh, with some of our retail partners, uh, some of the museums that we sell Sedition works in, uh, and also at festivals and, and art fairs. The idea is just to give you some idea of how you're looking at these works, how you might experience them on your devices. Um, when we first started out again, you'll notice that the edition sizes from the early pieces, such as this one, uh, are much higher. Uh, 10,000, 5,000, 2,000, universal everything. Uh, this is the work that uh, you were just mentioning with Matt Pike. Um, Matt Pike is the creative director of Universal Everything. In fact, he works so collaboratively with his group now that uh, he's removed his own name from the, the banner. Now he just calls them Universal Everything because he thinks it's unfair to take full credit for, for what is very much a collaborative effort. If you excuse the sound, uh, my videographer feels that contemporary art should only be shown with choirs of angels and cherubims and seraphims. Um, this is a more recent edition, uh, Quayola and Sinigalia. Uh, you'll notice the edition size on that is 250. This is something that we, uh, we adjusted pretty quickly. We realized quite soon that people wanted the edition run to sell out. They didn't want everyone to own it, um, which is why things like this piece, the digital edition of 10,000, those are very much the early pieces that, uh, that we started off with. Nowadays, you'll, you'll not see editions on Sedition released at that kind of size. They're usually anything from a single iter iteration, a single piece, up to an edition of two to five hundred. That's about as high as they go now. Field, a London-based collective, rather like uni Universal Everything. They're a group of artists who work together in a very collaborative way. And as you can see, these are just uh, some promotional images on how you might use the artworks, how you might enjoy them. Uh, and we've using some friends of mine on these adverts, in fact, so they're trying very hard to look like paid models. So our international audience, this is probably the biggest strength of Sedition, uh, is the kind of reach that we have. Um, over 500,000 followers and collectors, that's a little disingenuous, um, which is my middle name, but basically, uh, we have a, a 500,000 plus audience. The actual signed up membership uh, for Sedition is 58,000. So there's a, a considerably smaller audience that are actually on the site buying the works and collecting the, the pieces. 
Um, but that 500,000 is a real number. Uh, it's been built up over time through our social media, our blog, our newsletters, uh, the outreach and the kind of eyes and the audience that we have. Uh, and it is a very targeted audience as well. These are genuinely art-interested uh, individuals who are seeking this kind of stuff out online and in physical exhibitions. Um, so this is something that we, uh, we try to do a lot to help the artists or to support the artists that we work with. It was important to me that Sedition doesn't take a gallery model uh, and try and represent artists exclusively. Uh, we wanted to add extra tools, uh, another arrow to the artist's quiver, not to restrict them from working elsewhere. Uh, so the idea is that if they're on Sedition, uh, then we can help support any physical exhibitions, any projects they have, act as a, a portal or a funnel that will direct people's interest into other things that they're doing that are happening off-site or offline. Uh, so this is a, an important part of the process for us. This is uh, something that Powell mentioned earlier and has always been something that I felt was an interesting, it's a bit like the way we launched edition. It's a, a halfway step. The idea of a certificate of authenticity, and particularly an online, non-physical certificate of authenticity is in some ways a bit of a nonsense. It's there because initially when we're setting this up, we're creating a new ecosystem. And the way to make people comfortable with that was to mirror as closely as possible the physical system that currently exists. Certificates are an important way of doing that. Eventually, I think, this will probably become redundant. At the moment, it's still uh, a useful way of tracking ownership. Uh, people can see what they bought, which edition they own. It's signed by me as the director of Sedition, and it's signed by the artist issuing the work, uh, so you know which edition number you have as well. Um, oddly enough, people still gravitate towards certain numbers in the editions. Uh, people still pursue edition number one. Um, Obviously, this is a hangover from the days of silk screens and, and things where the first print was always a better quality than the earlier ones. It's, it's completely not relevant to digital media, but old habits die hard and people like specific numbers. Trade, um, again, something that uh, Powell mentioned. In fact, I should get you to do this. But um, Sedition Trade was a, a very important addition to the site. It's, uh, its main purpose, I think, is to underpin what we call the value proposition. Uh, when you're first starting up with uh, Sedition, there was uh, some resistance to the idea uh, amongst some people of, of uh, paying money for essentially a collection of, of pixels on a screen. Um, I never really understood this. To me, this is an argument that was put to bed a long time ago. There's no more inherent uh, value to an arrangement of pixels, uh, sorry, arrangement of uh, pigment on canvas than there is to pixels on a screen. It's, it's not the physical uh, object itself that accrues value. Um, but the trading platform really helped people to, uh, to identify with that and to understand that it's not a one-way street. You're not coming onto the site just to spend money and buy things. If you have an artwork and you decide it doesn't fit your collection, you're bored of it, you just don't think it is what you thought it would be or you just want to sell it, you can go onto the trading platform and do that. Um, we don't manage the prices there. The collectors, the artists, the users of the site do all that. We'll take a commission of the sale, um, but if you want to put your edition up there for a million pounds, you can. It's unlikely to sell, but that's, up your, that's your choice. The piece that uh, you can see here, which is the same one actually that, uh, that Powell mentioned earlier, uh, Ryoji Aikida. Uh, this was a, an important piece because Ryoji had very definite views on how he wanted this piece to be, uh, to be put out there. Uh, we recommended an edition size and we recommended a price and where he'd sit within that ecosystem since it's a world we created so we can guide people effectively in it. Um, Ryoji didn't want to go down that road. He wanted the price to be static, um, which means it stays at the same, same level throughout the, the sale of the edition. And he wanted it to be very cheap, very accessible to his collectors. So it was five pounds, an edition of 300, and unsurprisingly, it sold out almost instantly. Since then, on the trading platform, they're selling again currently between about 75 to 100 pounds. Um, and obviously, it's, a, it's still very small amounts of money, but as a percentage increase from five pounds to 100 pounds, that's quite exciting, and it allowed collectors to, to play the game of being a collector or an investor, uh, and just to, to have that interactivity, um, and again, to feel reassured that there was uh, some inherent value to what we were doing. The apps are how we recommend people look at the works. Um, they're really the best ways of, of viewing. To get around the protection of the files, the app was the way that we did that. You can now download your artwork files onto your device, so you have it and have perfect playback, whether or not you're online. But the way that we protect it is you can only download it into the app. It's a sandboxed, protected environment. The artist is happy that the work's not, get, not being copied or disseminated uh, in an unauthorized way. But the user and the collector is happy that they can access their work from the device without having to be connected to the internet. Our newest app, and the one that we're particularly excited about, um, We've realized very quickly that most people interacting with Sedition uh, will tend to use the small screen, their phone or the device, as the first 
port of point of contact. Um, but this is really an organizational tool. It's like baseball card collecting, checking what you've got, uh, going into the private view to sign up for the next work that's coming out. It's a good way of organizing it, but this screen is not ideal for viewing an artwork. A much larger canvas, if you will, is the TV screen in the home, and that's one of the things we wanted to try to, uh, to make sure was possible. We wanted Sedition, ideally, to be uh, something you didn't have to spend an enormous amount of money in terms of hardware and equipment. Uh, we do realize there's, a, there's definitely an appetite out there for a dedicated art viewing device, and that's what many of the companies that, uh, that were touched about earlier are doing. And we may well pursue that as well, but for now we wanted to try to make this integrate with things that people already own, something you don't have to step outside and, and spend a lot of money to get extra. This is the promotional video that we actually have on the App Store for uh, the Apple TV app. It's cathartic, but it really is a means for me to be able to express myself as well. Generally, I'm like kind of more of an old media man. I kind of... And the choirs of angels are back, I'm sorry about that. You only have a 30 second gap to try and explain what the app is about on the uh, Apple Store preview. So it was important to try and show there's some interviews, there are some artworks. It's not just somewhere you're going to go and buy uh, an artwork or buy a limited edition. The idea is that it should be an entry point, a portal to explore the art world. You can go to the artist's profile page, see what other exhibitions they've got going on, uh, historical projects, read interviews, essays, uh, editorials. It's, it's, the idea is to, to really envelop yourself in what you're interested in and explore it uh, without having to ha have a huge commitment. Artstream, our su subscription service, um, Powell mentioned this earlier, uh, ultimately this is a stream of 12 artworks. Each week one artwork is removed from that stream and a new one is added. Uh, anyone who subscribes to that has a, a chance to buy the art artwork that's removed at an advantageous price. Uh, so it gives you a chance to, to try out what there is from a, a curated package, as you will. Um, and then you can decide if it's for you, if you want to, to invest further in it, or just leave it alone. It's a very cheap and effective way of experiencing it without, again, having to commit a great deal towards doing so. Now, this is a, a project I'm really excited about, open platform. Um, on Sedition, you've got essentially two different areas. There's the curated platform and the open platform. Curated is an invitation-only platform, and that's where you're going to find the artists that we know and love, the, the Damien Hirsts, Tracy Emin, Yoko Ono, Barty Kerr. The open platform is a free forum. Any artist can sign up there and addition their work. We're rebuilding this at the moment. I want to offer more tools there, more promotional tools, more sharing tools, a better range of prices and addition size choices. But the idea is, is that we're, we're taking this out and offering it to everyone, not just the artists, but also the art schools, which I'm very excited about. Uh, we're currently talking to some art schools in London and about giving them uh, uh, discrete sections of the site they can use for their own college. So if you want to have a, an end-of-term exhibition, you can put it all up there online. Uh, you can make that as private or as public as you want. You can make it available only to alumni or to your current college, or you can make it broadcast around the world entirely in how you want to do it. But the beauty of it is, is it gives the art students a chance to dip a toe into the market, uh, get some idea of how they're engaging with their audience, start to build up a reputation and a profile without having to sign up to a, a gallery or an exclusive relationship or in any way restrict them from what they might want to do next. Um, also, we're a wealth of advice between myself, uh, the gallery directors, our curatorial team. There's a 50, 60 years of art world experience that they can draw from there. Um, and that's something we want to offer uh, to the artists to make sure that they, they have those resources. Um, I'm acutely aware that in teaching people to be artists at the art schools, which they do a fantastic job of, there's not enough focus on teaching them to be uh, artists within the art market, how to survive uh, as an artist and to, to uh, have an effective business, if you will. Uh, this is the same work, Matt, uh, Matt Pike and Universal Everything, the work that won really the, uh, the Golden Nika, Prezars Electronica. Having these collectible works with a very intimate personal ownership where um, it's maybe an edition of 50 or an edition of one or an edition of six, but also how we display works online um, through Vimeo or YouTube where you have 300,000 people who've watched it. The contemporary digital art world is really interesting in the sense that it's a, a new format that's, because of the nature of digital, the way it's so malleable and easily distributable, it's like how do you create something that is collectible, it is scarce, it is limited and it still has this uh, appeal. So I'm kind of torn between um, creating works 
that can be shared socially and have sort of 300,000 plays and creating works that can be enjoyed by one person and I'm I really interested in that kind of um, balance between the two. How you I'll cut Matt off there but uh, it's again touching on, this is a conversation we have with most of the artists we work with. Um, they all have that, that dichotomy of wanting to have their art viewed by as wide an audience as possible but still wanting to be able to, to provide and sell artworks to individuals who want to collect them. The museum partnerships that we work with, um, we have a, a number of different ways we do this. On one uh, level, we work with some museums to offer sedition artworks in the museum gift shop. Um, the museum takes a revenue share for that. We help support the exhibitions. Uh, artists will often donate some of those additions to the gift shop. If they do that, we'll match it so we don't take any revenue. It just benefits the museum. Um, this is, again, good for the whole ecosystem. It's good for the museums. They get more funding. The artist gets their work in there, and they have more exhibitions. And we have additional profile and, and reputation, so it, it works all around. Um, these are not all retail partners, however. Uh, the Royal Academy is our, our big retail partner, and we're about to open at uh, the Broad Museum in Los Angeles next week. Um, so that's a, a big project we're very excited about. Some of these other guys, though, have worked with us to actually launch editions on the site uh, from artists they've had exhibitions with. Uh, people like um, uh, the Kunstpalast, we did a, a thing with them for Vim vendors. Um, Makaba, Tel Aviv Museum, uh, Stavanger Museum. Uh, these guys have all actually purchased sedition works for the permanent collection in the museum which we're very excited about. Uh, and the ICA and the Serpentine uh, on this list have actually come to us to edition works um, with artists such as Yoko Ono and Barty Kerr, uh, and they'll take a revenue share for those works. So it's a, a very useful project, and we're trying to expand the number of museum partners that we're working with at the moment. Thank you. Uh, this is the retail display and how we actually sell these in the museums. Ultimately, we've created a <clears throat> it's like a, an iTunes gift card. It's a little plastic card. It has a silver strip on the back. You scratch off the strip, enter that code, and then that artwork is automatically in your collection. This was almost depressing to me at the time. We invested significant sums of money in setting up a completely non-physical, virtual online site, commissioned hundreds of artworks, did the whole thing, and then I created a plastic card for £1.50 and everyone went nuts. So it just goes to show it's the little things that can move the dial. But these are actually very exciting, and it shows that there's still a human uh, impulse to have some kind of physical connection to an artwork or to something that they're purchasing. Um, the Royal Academy display on the right, uh, those cards are, are branded with the Royal Academy, and, and ultimately they just benefit the Royal Academy when you buy them. They're only showing Royal Academicians, so it's a, a small fraction of the artists who are on the site. The frame. This is, uh, again, something Pal mentioned earlier. Uh, we're very aware that uh, the beauty of having an online co uh, company is that you're in constant contact with both your artists and your, your collectors. And so you can ask them directly for anything they want, and they can tell you, and they frequently do, tell you what they want. And the big demand at the moment is for that, that viewing object that is commensurate uh, as an art display. Um, again, looking at your phone or even looking at your iPad is one way to engage the artwork, but the context is not necessarily right. Frame it, put it on the wall, free standing on the desk, uh, on the larger screen, and suddenly it becomes a far more engaging piece of art. Uh, some of the partnerships we're making, Mural are one of them. Um, I'm very aware that at the moment, and again this is something that was mentioned earlier, uh, all of these different areas have a closed system, so you can view your artworks within the Sedition universe, but not necessarily in Mural, or not necessarily in Depict, and so on and so forth. Long term, this is something I very much want to break down. Uh, there's a slide at the end of this, which I'll come to uh, with some ideas as to how we might be able to do that. Um, initially, and the way that we protect things, and the only way we could actually make it happen uh, was to have uh, an enclosed universe. You buy artworks in Sedition, you view artworks in Sedition, and you sell artworks on Sedition. Um, that's something I definitely want to change. Public art displays are, for me, the most important way of really completing the circle for the collector. Uh, when you put a, a public exhibition on and people kind of get wowed by these works and, and they experience them properly, that really kind of makes them think, okay, I get it, now I want to have that, or now I want to have that at home, or I, can, you know, I know a great place where that would look fantastic. And that's really where it becomes quite exciting. Um, this is a project we did with the Times Square Arts Alliance in New York, uh, and Tracy Emin basically did a, a big display in uh, uh, February 2013. We put Tracy Emin neons on all the screens in Times Square every night throughout that month. Uh, which was great fun, and Tracy was particularly excited. This is uh, another piece of uh, a development for the business that I wasn't expecting when we set it up. Um, hotels and various corporate displays are actually now a faster growing part of our business than, than anything else. Um, 
most hotels will have quite a tired limited edition print on the wall. It doesn't look particularly good. We now offer them a chance to have a digital collection there. For the hotel, it's, it's a no-brainer. There's no inventory, no shipping, no insurance, no dusty thing to, to take care of. And they can update the collection every two weeks, six months, yearly, however often they want to. Uh, so it's a great way of making what they're doing a bit more cutting edge and a bit more interesting for the people coming to the hotel. And the artists obviously love to do this as well, since they get a much wider audience for their work. Uh, we've done a number of other physical events. This was uh, at the Hospital Club in Covent Garden uh, with, with the group Field. Uh, they had some virtual reality helmets and headsets made from uh, Oculus Rift, as well as uh, a sponsorship from LG. So they provided projectors and screens for us to show uh, the artworks on Sedition throughout that room. Um, We've done this with a number of people, like the, uh, uh, the Modern Media and Leap, a Chinese group of artists that we partnered with, uh, was done in the same way. It's great to see that uh, this medium has the sort of capability of connecting with all kinds of different audiences. By having the interactive element and having something that people could, uh, could play with and wear themselves, uh, it really changed the whole vibe of the, uh, of the evening um, because people were a lot more engaged and a lot more involved themselves, um, which kind of affected how people looked at the photographs as well and really enjoyed that. With digital media, what has happened um, is that maybe art has become the, the exclusivity of art um, that is traditionally such an important element um, is, uh, is dissolving more and more and I personally um, enjoy that um, and we're probably part of a, a, a younger generation of artists who, um, who are not, um, not so much worried about keeping their work exclusive. Instead we want to, we want to actually talk to people. Um, the more people who can engage with our work and the more people can find access to it, um, the more interesting it is, the more conversations we have. Um, and I think that's why we're, um, we're really keen to have our work uh, live on different platforms and different channels. Um, we publish our work online. The media and the platforms are there. What Vera's talking about there actually is, for me, one of the most exciting parts of running Sedition. Um, it's not uh, exclusive to the younger artists on the site, and it's not exclusive to the digital studios on the site either, but there is definitely an increased rate of collaboration, partnering, sharing that goes on with those groups than there are with, with some of the more traditional artists that we started out with. Um, and I find that very exciting. I spend a lot of my time now sort of putting different groups together, uh, a musician with an artist who wants to collaborate to produce a work, or uh, different groups who got excited by an exhibition they've seen and they want to work on other pieces. So that's something that, that we really enjoy doing. And this is the last slide. This is uh, what I was talking about, about the ability to take sedition artworks out of sedition. We need some way of making sure that if you buy an artwork, a digital artwork on sedition, you should be able to view that within sedition within any kind of platform or any online media that you can get to. The only way to do that is to have some way of, uh, of tracking and, and essentially uh, a fungible object that can be moved around, traded, passed from person to person, and still maintain its integrity. It looks like the best way for us to do this is blockchain technology. Um, I'm not a tech, so I can't give you the reasons for this, but the understanding that I have is that uh, the technology will allow the provenance, or at least the transactional history of an artwork, to be built into its very DNA. It's part of the code itself. Um, so this looks quite exciting. We're currently talking to a company called Ascribe, who you can just below the, the image there, uh, who can do all of this for us, and they do uh, this in a number of other areas. It takes a little bit more than just assigning blockchain to each artwork, though. There's going to be some fundamental changes to the site, and we're talking to some of the other big players on the market because it will take a little bit of collaboration for everyone to, to come on the same, uh, same page. But hopefully, I think they will see the need to do that. I think it's, uh, it's much more important that we all work together to raise this field and make sure that everyone has a, an, even, an even playing field. Thank you very much.